what have you thought about the kind of the interaction in this series? Uh, me personally, I liked it. You know, I thought the first two games were being too nice. The first three games, helping guys up off the floor, smiling, talking to guys, and yeah, I didn't like that. So I'll take game four over anything else. So, you know, talking trash, being physical, whatever you got to do to try to get that edge to win. You gotta Are do there it. more theatrics in store tonight? Well, Ty Lue certainly hope so. Hey there, welcome to SI Now. It is Monday, it's June 12th. And I'm Maggie Gray to everyone watching on Facebook Live. Well, thanks for tuning in. Coming up later in the show, we'll look at where Sidney Crosby now ranks in terms of the greatest hockey players of all time as the Penguins are back to back Stanley Cup champions and fresh off his induction into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Evander Holyfield will relive the greatest and most bizarre moments from his boxing career. He will be right here on our set. But we begin with game five of the NBA Finals. That's tonight. NBA writer Rohan Ned Carney is here. All right, we heard Ty Lue. He wants this game to be physical. He wants this game to be personal. We saw how the refs called the game in Cleveland in game four. How do you think this game will go tonight? What will be the pace? How physical will it be? Give us your answer. Well, I think the fact that they're playing in Oakland, you know, Golden State really gets, you know, amped up in front of their home crowd. So I expect it to be you know, that same kind of torrid pace we've seen through the first four games. I do think the refs are going to try to take control of this game early. Things were getting really chippy, you know, throughout game four, really. You had the Zaza incident. You had the Draymond outburst. I don't think the refs are going to want any of, that, any of that. I think they're going to try to take control of this game early, make sure players are kind of keeping their emotions in check, maybe send out an early technical or two, just kind of keep the calm. But I do think the pace of the game will ultimately – you know, end up in that Golden State frenetic kind of chaos they play in. Okay, well, going off of game four, it doesn't matter if they call a technical early. They can always change who <laughs> yeah. they put the technical on if it suits them. Uh, you mentioned how good Golden State is at home. 44-5 and five on the season, winning by an average of 20 points. But if, if the Warriors lose game five, how does that change the series? I mean, I think it changes it pretty dramatically. I mean, then Cleveland's going home, and, you know, home court advantage is gone at that point. It's just kind of one and one. We saw, you know, Cleveland was able to win game seven on the road last year, so I don't think they're kind of scared of that. It's a big if, obviously, but I do think this, the, the tenor of the series changes a lot. It would go from Golden State kind of having a stranglehold, kind of being this overwhelming favorite to, hey, like, you know, what's going on here? You know, could it happen again? And I do think at the end of the day, you know, the Warriors, they're humans, and I do think doubt starts to creep in and, and – I don't think that it would be – they'd feel the same level of favorites as they were, you know, heading into game five if they were to lose this game. But it's a huge if. It's going to take a lot for the Cavs to win this game. So I don't think Golden State's too worried just yet. Yeah, and by it you mean – falling after having a 3-1 yeah. lead and giving up the championship. Of course, all signs pointing now to Warriors closing this series out tonight. If that happens, they would go 16-1 and in the postseason. And just by the fact that they lost one game – does it change how you think of whether this Warriors team can can lay claim to the greatest of all time? On, a, on like a statistical level, not really. I, I do think they're probably the greatest basketball team of all time. Just two MVP players in their prime uh, with two likely Hall of Famers, you know, by their side. Having said that, I mean, basketball is that sport where you just kind of you should be able to pull out numbers kind of so easily, right? You know, whether it's Jordan in game six or, or Wilt in the 100 points, it's just those – those things kind of help your narrative, you know, and I do think 16-0 to would have been a great for the Warriors to kind of have that. It's unassailable. You, you know, you can't point in anything to, to diminish their legacy if they go 16-0. to The one loss, I don't know if it changes that much, but we've seen something similar, right? Like the Lakers did that in the early 2000s. So that, that one loss does kind of – it takes away the uniqueness of it, but – if you really want to get down to brass tacks and break it down, I, I do think they're probably the best team of all time. We're asking you on Facebook Live, simple question, who will win game five? I think the Warriors are going to take yeah. this one. I know a lot of us picked Warriors in five. I think Chris Ballard was the only guy who picked the Warriors in four. He was so close. So, you know, a lot of us at SI picked Warriors in five, and I think this is what we expected. You know, Cleveland getting one game at home, but now it's going back to Oracle. They have the 3-1 lead. I think they're going to be very, very focused. They're going to feel great in front of the home crowd. Draymond's going to play in the game. Kevin Durant's going to play in the game. So I think that gives Golden State the edge. Okay, enough about five-on-five five basketball. That's so yesterday. <laughs> Let's talk three-on-three three basketball. Of course, that's taking center stage. And it's not just because of Ice Cube's Big Three League, which kicks off later on this month. On Friday, it was announced that three-on-three three basketball will now be an Olympic sport starting in the year 2020. Now the details still have to be hashed out, but it 
we can talk about it. Who would be on your three on three basketball team representing the United States? So for, I'm really, really glad you asked me this question because I see people on Twitter, you know, obviously everyone's having this discussion. Who's their three on three team going to be? And people are overthinking this so much. They're okay. like, I'm going to put Russ because you need this for the internet. Just pick the three best basketball players in the world, all of whom happen to be from America. LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Stephen Curry. Who's going to beat that team? What three? What Name one basketball player better than any of those three. You can't because they're the three best players in the world. You simply, like, come on. Like, they all three can handle the ball. LeBron, they all three can play defense. It's... But what about Curry's defense could be the liability on the court in that scenario? No, they'll be fine. Like, Kevin Durant's a seven-footer. Like, him and LeBron can clean up everything at the rim if they need to. LeBron was saying the other day, oh, I might not even be the best three-on-three -three player on my team. I might That's a, just such a load of bull. Come on. Oh, my God. When there's less players on the court, LeBron James becomes even better. Even better. I, I mean, I guess I would say this. When I was thinking about my team, I was thinking about some kind of Anthony Davis, mm. Durant situation with perhaps a Kyrie. Would okay. you accuse me of overthinking? I, uh, listen, Maggie, I would never, I would never want to accuse you of <laughs> anything. It's okay. Bring but it on. Just a little bit. I mean, <laughs> I, would, I just think I would be comfortable with my team against yours. Let's just say that. Okay, so obviously the United States is, would not be competing against themselves. They'd be competing against the whole world. So looking internationally, which team do you think could give the U.S. the biggest run for their money uh, in a three-on-three -three scenario? So this is tough. I mean, there's so many great players, obviously, from many countries, but they're kind of scattered a bit. If it was a few years ago, you can make a good case for France with Nick Batum and Tony Parker. I think you got to take Spain. I mean, you got Ricky Rubio, you got the Gasol brothers, you got Sergio Yell, who's playing great overseas. Uh, people love him. So I think probably Spain, you know, pick some combination of those guys. Uh, you know, I think they got Miritich up on the screen here. He's another another candidate. So Spain would probably give us the biggest challenge. They're not taking down my team, though. No, they're probably not. I think the U.S. would be favored heavily in this three-on-three -three matchup. But it's a great discussion to have. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait till the year 2020 to see it come true. But we got the big three later on this year. I say send Allen Iverson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's do it, even if it's the year 2020. Rohan, thank you. Enjoy the game tonight. Over the weekend, Evander Holyfield was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Before we hear from the champ, here is famed boxing trainer and, and analyst Teddy Atlas on what made Holyfield stand in a class of his own. Evander Holyfield, great shape, great condition, great body. I mean, the Adonis sculptured body, all of that, but that didn't speak to the toughness inside him. And that came from his mother. I mean, that's, uh, he'd be the first to tell you. You know, he made a mistake, he had to pay for it. He had to learn to be accountable. So he didn't want to make mistakes. I know we use the cliche almost, heart. But it, it, was, it was more than just heart. It was, again, the understanding that you had to face things. You didn't face things, so it was a price to pay. And he beat guys like Tyson, who were bigger than him, bigger punches than him, faster than him, and he beat them because he was tougher than them. He was tougher than them, not, not just in a way where you slug out tough, but tough in a way, again, where there's no submission, where he was prepared to do whatever he had to do. And, I mean, what showed it more than when he got his ear bit off? I mean, come on, who else wouldn't just take the exit right out and say disqualify this guy who who does not play by the rules, who should never fight again, who did something this despicable, disqualify him and let me get my win and get out of here and go to the hospital. No, he says, put my mouthpiece in so I can go knock him out. You know, we hear the word honest. He, he was in the ring and he was gonna find a way. He wasn't asking for any edge anyway. Matter of fact, he would overcome whatever he had to overcome. But just get in there like, like a blue collar guy. He was a guy that didn't have to come from anything fancy, didn't have to wear anything fancy, didn't have to have a fancy entourage around him. And that's for those young fighters out there. Didn't need, you know, the fancy robe. Didn't need any of those things. Just a blue collar guy, bring your lunch pail, go to work and be the best in the world. Yeah, and I'm pleased to be joined now by the four-time heavyweight champion just inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame, Evander Holyfield. You were just listening to the very end there of what Teddy Atlas had to say about you. Would you agree with that assessment? You were a blue-collar guy, didn't need any of the flash, and beat your opponents just by heart alone? 
Exactly. I'm, you know, you, you get paid to work and you go do exactly what work is it's all about. You said before the weekend's festivities that it wasn't really going to sink in until the weekend was over. Well, now we're here on a Monday, all of the pomp and circumstance is over. How does it feel to be a Hall of Famer? Uh, I'm honored and I'm, I'm mostly happy about them being in agreement that <laughs> I'm as good as that they said. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, some of your most famous, infamous fights, if you will, obviously. The second fight with Mike Tyson, where he bit your ear off. I, when you are thinking back to your two fights with Tyson, of all the fighters that you squared off with in, in the ring, what did those fights, though, mean to you and to me, mean to your career? Well, it meant a lot because Tyson was the fighter that everybody, I'm some, even some family members, would say, he going to beat your behind. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm, and, you know, he was a good fighter, and somehow people had something thinking that if a guy is, if a guy don't curse as much, uh, they like the guy that got a bad reputation is better than the guy who got a good reputation. You know, I, you know, you don't know about to choose their parents, but you know, my mom was very strict on me. There's a lot of things that she told me not to do, and it worked, and so I, I decided to. It remained the same. I don't have to curse to prove that I'm bad. You know, I'm, I don't have to brag. All I have to do is just go out there and do what my mama said do, and and you ain't got to worry about if you don't succeed. All this gibberish you on spoken out. You ain't got to live up to it. Right. You let your boxing do the talking. I mean, just yes. going to your nickname, the real deal. You never <laughs> felt like you needed to put a persona on. Yet you had these unbelievable moments that happened during your fights. Not only Tyson biting you, but also the fan man. This bizarre moment where a man parachutes into your second fight with Riddick Bowe. What was the more surreal experience for you out of those two? Well, wait, well. Get bit bit on the ear, then you know that that's something I would never. But I never thought nobody gonna try to get in a ring either. I'm some, you know, both of them were just important because you, know, you know, Ray Debo was a guy that you know who was a great fighter and he four years younger than me, but a lot heavier. And but you know, he was one of my best friends. And right today we still good friends. And and that first fight. He beat the daylights out of me. And, you know, and the thing is, but I realized that he kept cheating. He kept hitting on the brakes. So the second fight, I watched it, and I was like, no more. No more of that. It, it, them hitting me on the brakes. And when he hit me on the brake, every time I hit him back, you know, I was going to get the last lick. Wow, and you guys ended up having a, just a phenomenal trilogy of fights that we'll remember forever. Uh, looking at the sport today, what do you think is, is the biggest difference from when you were fighting in your prime to what you're seeing now? Well, I, I truly believe that the, as an amateur, they don't show the Olympic fighters no more like they used to do. With Howard Cosell, they, they, they put boxing on television. They, get the younger people in the box at a younger age. And so you, when you stay in the amateur program a long time, you learn the game, you know, more so than thinking about how much money you're going to get. Well, that's interesting because it seems like now you, the fighters need to do so much to promote their own fights because we're not really familiar with the fighters from their amateur days. There are not many of them. You see now that one of the biggest topics in the sport is whether Floyd Mayweather is going to fight in MMA uh, fighter and Conor McGregor. Is that something that you want to watch? Do you have any desire to see the outcome of that fight? Well, not really because Floyd going, yeah, F Floyd is a better boxer. So if they box, Floyd going to win. And if they do that MMA, Floyd going to lose. I'm talking about, you know, you know, whatever the person specializes in, the guy got the favor and it's almost, if, if the great guy today can't beat Floyd over there, what make you gonna think a guy just because he can choke people out, but it, you can't choke in this. Considering that if this fight gets made, Floyd and Connor, it would be Floyd's 50th win. That would bring him to 50 and 0. Should it count as his 50th win, considering like what you said, 
Connor is not a boxer up to the level of some of the other fighters that, that Floyd has fought before. It's almost like the minor leagues. But you, when you put yourself in that situation, then I was talking about he doing it willingly. I was talking about when you, they making it, he want to. I was talking about then again, it's an entertainment, and I think it really do help both of the sport. Like, I, you know, after both guys in agreement. And, you know, but Floyd kind of have the, the advantage. I would say. It's been a while since we've seen an undisputed heavyweight champion. You've been to that mountaintop. Which heavyweight do you think possesses the skills, the proper mindset to unify the belts and be the undisputed heavyweight champ? Well, I, you know, it has to do with fighters who have the confidence. And, you know, um, so, you know, I, I've been around, um, I've been around the Alabama guy. Deontay Wilder. Deontay. Deontay, he got a lot of confidence. I'm telling you, he's a late bloomer. But he do what's necessary to win. And so now you got Anthony Joshua. Now Anthony Joshua show you what he could do. And then you got the, you got the guy Parker. I'm telling you, you I, I think it getting ready to blaze up because, you know, everybody want to, and all three of them want to be undisputed, and, and that's good. And, and I think that the organization should come together and f see how they can have one good heavyweight and, and, and it, it make, I guess it bring, it bring the fights back together like they used to be. Yeah, we always talk about how we're waiting for that next big heavyweight, someone to unify the belts and bring attention back to that weight class. You know, as you've been around the Hall of Fame this weekend, I'm sure you've been hearing a lot of stories, people coming up and congratulating you. You start thinking about your legacy. What do you think the mark is that you leave on the sport, Evander? Well, I... Uh, I was undisputed. I was one of the undisputed champion. I fought everybody, and uh, and you know, I mean, the art of the game is not so much a losing. The art of the game is how much uh, are you gonna are you gonna be the one that take it to another level? You know, Ali did it three times. I did it four, but you know, Floyd Patterson did it too. John of Seven. It starts off with somebody. John of Seven, first person did it. Then you did like this, and you. But it, it, you know, it, when you set marks, when you when you keep records, records are meant to be broken. So I'm not, I'm not mad if mine get broken. I, but you know, this show that the boxing is growing. Yeah, do you think so? What do younger fighters say to you about the impact that you've had on their career? Well, I'm to me, you know, it's a lot of fighters. Oh man, oh if you you because I, I I get a little basic stuff. Listen, follow direction, not quit. You know, I say, look, I say, look, if if, if it came down, I, I, you know, my record would have been, uh, I think I've been five and two when I first lost. Because this kid, this kid named Cecil Collar beat me twice. And I guess, man, I started crying. My mama made me, my mama wouldn't let me quit. My mom said, when you beat him, then you can, then you can go. You ain't got to box him more. I finally beat him when I turned 12. And my mom said, you don't have to do it anymore. And I said, but I won. <laughs> but she said, you, you, you make better decisions when you win, more so than when you lose. Wow. I know how much your mother had an influence on you growing up. Clearly, she is the reason, I think, why you became the champ. You give her so much credit. What do you think that she would say if she could be here? Of course, she passed away. What do you think she would say watching you get inducted into the boxing hall? Well, she had been happy, and she would, she, you know, she would have told people, saying he listened, he did what I asked him to do, and, and it made her feel proud because I was able to listen. So my mother started listening to me a lot because she said, you know, he trusts me, now I can trust him. <laughs> and, that, and, I, and I think that's what she would have probably said. Evander Holyfield, it's so great to see you and talk with you again, and congratulations on this great honor, very well deserved. And thank you. Thank you. After three years of injuries and uncertainty, Guess who's back? Rafael Nadal charged through the French Open, winning his 15th major tournament and his 10th at Roland Garros for his dominant performance. We've made Nadal our adrenaline performer. It's presented by Toyota. 
let's go places. Nadal did not drop a set on his way to victory, beating Stan Wawrinka 6-2, 6-3, 6-1 in the final. In fact, Nadal dropped only 35 games in this tournament. That's second only to Bjorn Borg in the 1978 French Open as the fewest games surrendered in a men's Grand Slam. After the match, the Spaniard acknowledged how special this win is for him. Magic all the things that happened in, in this tournament for me, you know, so very happy for everything. Today was a, a very important day for me. Have been um, some tough moments the last times, uh, injuries, so it's, it's great to, to have a big success like this again. This was the third time Nadal has won the French Open without dropping a set. In those previous years, 2008 and 2010, Nadal also went on to win at Wimbledon, which begins in just three weeks. Looking at history, Nadal continues to climb the ranks of the greatest tennis players ever. His 15th Grand Slam moves him into second place on the all-time list, trailing only Roger Federer, who has 18 Grand Slam titles. Congrats to all those Penguins fans. But turning to baseball, a team that was a dynasty and hopes to become one again are the New York Yankees. Ben Ryder is here to talk some baseball with us. All right, we have to talk about Aaron Judge. He's been a revelation, already been on the cover of Sports Illustrated, wearing the cool shirt from the Sandlot. There's nothing that he can't do. He propelled the Yankees into first place. But, Ben, what happens if Judge cools off? I mean, how will that affect the rest of the Yankee squad? Well, he's going to cool off. He's leading the triple crown categories right now. Aaron Judge, I'll, I'll say right now, Aaron Judge is not winning the triple crown in the American League this year. How can you be so sure? I'm sure. Okay. Pretty <laughs> sure. I don't know. This guy's already kind of amazed me um, and everybody else. But look, I don't think they're in that much trouble if he cools off. Yes, he's getting all the headlines. He's on all the highlights. But this is a team that's much better, much faster than anyone thought they would be all around. They're leading baseball in runs scored. And they're also leading the American League in fewest runs allowed. That is not a team that is reliant on just one guy, no matter how many 500-foot home runs he hit. This is a team that has seven players with OPSs above 850. That's crazy. And in the minor leagues, they have guys who could come in and fill in if Aaron Judge kind of goes down or goes into a slump. This is a team that's just gotten to where they were going a lot faster than even they expected. Okay, so what's the expectation for the Yankees this year? What's reasonable? Reasonable, I mean, wild card. I still think that the Red Sox are probably the class of the AL East. You know, getting David Price back, he's had his ups and downs. Still one of the better pitchers around. Um, they've kind of underperformed, and here they are just a few games back in the AL East. They seem a bit stronger, especially I don't expect the Yankees pitching to hold up to the incredible degree that it has. But, yeah, I mean, a wild card this year. And really, Maggie, I, I said it, but it's two years early. Everybody was looking at, oh, 2000, after 2018 is when these guys, they'll add Bryce Harper or something like that. They'll add Manny Machado. They're, they're there now. It's amazing. Let's it turn is. to the National League. While the Nationals were celebrating Max Scherzer's accomplishment of becoming the third fastest pitcher to record 2,000 strikeouts, the bullpen once again proved to be the Achilles heel for the team. How concerned, Ben, should the Nationals be that once again this bullpen could derail their World Series dreams? They should be very concerned. I mean, this is a bullpen that has an ERA up near five, right? For the one of the best teams in the National League. 
Um, that's just unacceptable. Seemed as if they had found some stability at the back end with the rookie Coda Glover. But here he's back on the disabled list. Things are in shambles again. You know, it's very rare that things play out exactly as we thought they would, you know, even over the winter or in spring training. But you looked at this team, you said, oh, their Achilles heel is the bullpen. And here we are. Great team. Bullpen's not getting it done. Okay, so who should they be targeting then at the trade deadline? They're going to need to get help from someone. Well, here's the thing, right? Their closer right now should be Felipe Rivero, who has a .53 ERA. But he's on the Pirates because they traded him last year because they had the same problem. They traded him for Mark Melanson at the deadline. Melanson did a great job. You know, didn't quite, you know, get them to the ring they've been aiming for for so long. But it kind of shows the dangers of overpaying for a particular closer, right? Like Rivero could have been the shutdown closer for them for years, and here they are in the same situation as they were last year. So you could look at a guy like Kelvin Herrera um, of the Royals. You could look at Alex Colome of the Rays. You could look at David Robertson from the White Sox, but you really have to play the market. I know that you need a, a closer, but you can't overpay because you're just going to keep kicking the can down the road having the same issue every year. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe the Nationals were shocked that Melanson ended up signing with the San Francisco Giants instead of re-signing with the Nats. But it, you kind of sound like you're skeptical, like maybe they won't go out and get someone at the deadline. I think they'll get somebody, okay? okay? And I think they might want to get two people, right? Like maybe you can get David Robertson and Tommy Conley of the White Sox as a package, or maybe they can get Kelvin Herrera and Mike Miner, you know, because obviously they need more than one guy with an ERA near five. I'm just saying be careful, you know. They've already traded a lot of prospects over the past few years in the Adam Eaton trade for Melanson and a few others. You can't completely destroy your future for a couple months of a closer. Something to think about for the Washington Nationals. That bullpen continues to bite them. Ben Ryder, thanks so much. Really appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for having me. All right, that's going to do it for this Monday edition of SI Now. Of course, we'll be back tomorrow. We always are at 1030 a.m. Eastern time. But until then, keep it locked to SI.com for all the latest news. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, will you? At SI Now Live. We'll be eternally grateful to you. Enjoy game five tonight of the NBA Finals. We'll see you tomorrow.